Feminism is not the age today in which we are living, unlike the previous ages, who used to think of their age as a modern one. Chaucer's age was also called a modern, but then the first time when it was introduced, it was introduced as a part of Renaissance. So Renaissance was a kind of a cultural movement, right? it was a kind of literary movement, art movement, as well as the discovery and the science, as well as because of the Galilean and other. So ge geographical discoveries was also there and several other, like uh, they were against what the tradition has given them through religion, something like uh, the uh, conservatives and uh, kind of mentality which was, you know, uh, it's arising them to stay into their own like arena and not peep out, peep into other, which is also another uh, truth or even you can say the reality. So truth is something that I am, I am just taking this term from uh, uh, Michel Foucault. He's a one philosopher, he used to be a one philosopher uh, two or three day, decade ago and he talked about truth and how the truth is like, you know, manipulated, created, and, you know, uh, this is how uh, the one class which, uh, which was one class rule directly and directly on the other class. So that is the truth, something that which is created. So every, uh, like every field, even uh, whether it is political, social, religious, all these institutes actually, these are the institutes, they create their own truth to survive. And basically, this Christianity is right from the beginning. For their uh, for their survival, they hadn't any kind of question. But later on, then when people uh, came to know about several other factors of life, the other aspects of life, when they discovered that this is uh, not something that is being told to them is true, complete truth, right? So there are other truths as well, which is which has been discovered. So such uh, inventions, you know. Uh, bringing something new into uh, their knowledge and the hunger of knowledge. Basically, this is something that is a base of Renaissance, hunger of knowledge. And uh, due to this, everything was like something that they were approaching towards modern. So modernism as basically this concept was, uh, you know, uh, more uh, intensified there in Renaissance. Later on, we have seen several ages that they have discovered the, and given a different interpretation on modernism. But ours, when we talk about modernism, modern age, it is in the reference to literature and the age of literature. So particularly an era which occurred somewhere after 1900 to 1965, as per our syllabus, but uh, according to some other the uh, scholars, it is uh, like between two world wars. So first world war which started somewhere in 1914 and uh, ended in 1919 19 or 1920, right? Somewhere in like that. So uh, right from that 1914 and, and, and then after, uh, whatever that the literatures, uh, the art movement, the cultural movements which took place during this time and uh, they contributed into uh, their own individual field and even given to other field as well because these are something uh, which this age is something that is uh, uh, that is having a kind of a reciprocal relationship between two disciplines when uh, the paintings we, which uh, cannot uh, like uh, cannot just uh, be self-sufficient and just, uh, you know, prove itself, but it has also contributed, it becomes giver to other fields like literature as well. So like we have imagism somewhere, we have expressionism, right? Expressionist art, which comes from, where from? Paintings, right? Such kind of arts that you can see, and even as well, like others, any other ideas, whatism, Futurism, all these were born out of the other art forms other than literature and so on. So even surrealist art, you can say the surrealism 
was uh, uh, again out of this painting, the art of not craft. Basically, and you know uh, what is a surrealist concept? Surreal. It has a real in it, in, in its own self. Reality is there, but that is fractured, that is fragmented, which is expressed through like some something is real. You can see that the man is there with the with the like uh, you know uh, the complete uh, body is there, but when you see the face, it is an apple. Right? The clock is there, you know, but it is melting. So melting clocks. Salvador Dali, right. So the concept is something that taken taken from the reality, but it is fragmented, fractured, modified into vision, into like that own surreal vision. And uh, this is what something that they have combined two things together. And not only this, but then there are. Uh, uh, literary writings as well, born out of the surrealist concept. How they have done this? They have done this through their uh, like uh, hallucinations, inducing themselves through uh, different uh, drugs and leakers, and then uh, they have written something out of whatever that came into their mind. You know, this is something similar you will find that uh, the Kubla Khan was written by. Who is written that? Coleridge. So both, uh, what kind of drugs they used to take? They were called opium eater, right? Opium eaters. And uh, this was something common in, this, in that age, romantic age, where uh, they wanted to write something that is not connected with the social realities, political reality, because all these uh, realities that, that brings something that is a kind of political notion, social notions, cultural, that is traditional and even religious, you know, that a kind of monopoly, which is that uh, you have to think in that stereotype way, you cannot think the other way. So uh, this is a kind of a frame, a structured way of thinking out of this is because that's kind of, you know, uh, a kind of dominance of because every field I say that they, they wanted to survive. And that's why what they do whatever that they can try to do, like manipulating psychologically the people. So basically that this age has discovered that the reality is not outside, the reality is inside. What they have discovered throughout the, uh, you know, throughout all these centuries, they have discovered outside the reality. They tried to, you know, uh, they tried to amend socially, culturally things outside, but then it, the the problem was not outside the problem was inside inside the mind because that they are dominated and uh, and psychologically dominated this was the discovery of psychology psychoanalytic theories by sigmund freud actually come to us to literature and it has given a great amount of uh, literary products we have uh, virginia woolf she writes about uh, the female freedom and woman writings, she, she talks about that. It is only possible when we understand the human psychology, the depth of that, uh, the, the things that when we touch, we understand that this is, see, this complete literature has given us something which is based on psychology. Even uh, taboo breakers, they were, there were also some writers who were taboo breakers. What is taboo? Yes, something that is uh, restricted, socially restricted, and cannot be openly discussed. There cannot be a kind of, uh, you know, a natural discourse on certain things like sex, right? So you cannot talk about it that openly in those days, in those times. Now, now we have sex education, everything. We have a kind of discourse, you know, discourse, that kind of term which we have to understand, where there is a, like, this is a classroom discourse where there are certain limitations, there are several freedoms as well, you can discuss on. There are other like family discourse, you know, when you talk in the family, in your family, you have certain limitations, you will have that in the mind. Okay, you cannot talk to your father this, you cannot talk to your mother, something like this. 
So you cannot talk to your brother or, ma or sisters. Like certain things are there that you cannot discuss. You can discuss with your friends. Certain things are there. So these are the limitations that when you enter in the realm of personal life, that pers the, so cer certain discourses are there. When you enter in the realm of professional or the public life, there so certain discourses are there, and you can discuss that things with that uh, the uh, with the people. You have these communications, and you have some liberation. So liberties and some limitations. So what I was talking about that uh, discourses, taboo breakers, writers, and uh, anyone, any idea to whom we can call a taboo breaker. The 50 years, a half century, his one novel was banned because of obscenity and abuse. And uh, any idea regarding this? Lady Chatterley's lover. Who's written that? Lady Chatterley's lover. D. H. Lawrence. Who's written the uh, sons and lovers? The kangaroos. Is the writer who has given seminal work year after year. He has produced novels right from 1911 till 1927. Every year, each year, you will find a new novel, a new concept, a new breaking concept. He uh, tried to use, like, why that was a taboo? Because uh, this every year, every work, there was uh, something that was going against. The traditional norms uh, presided, uh, pre-decided by the society, the cultures, English culture, because he was English, basically he was English, and uh, he also talked about some, uh, you know, uh, when England and Germany that the relation was somewhere in disrupting. He also intervened and in uh, through his literature, through his paintings, he was also a painter as well with his wife. She was German. See now, uh, this intercultural kind of aspect you will find that they were, uh, they were, they were not favoring wars. And, and this is somewhere. They were, you know, they were doubted upon that about their uh, pet, like patriotism towards England. They were, they were seen in like with these doubts that I, either they are on the part of Germany and maybe they are spying, they are spying on us. So there were several uh, bends on their paintings as well as other uh, writings. He was also a poet, great poet as well, you can say. But basically what he used, he used in his uh, novels the Freudian psychology with his own modification. Like he has given like that is a relationship of blood, something that he talks. And through through that, uh, uh, like Freudian psychology, we have also several other writers. We have writers like James Joyce, who has written Ulysses. Which other works he has written? The portrait of the artist, a young man. And uh, another writer who has written that, the portrait of the artist as a young dog. I guess uh, Edward L.B. <laughs> portrait as an artist as a young dog, somewhere after like. Uh, and he was, I guess, a surrealist writer. And such surrealist writer can do so, I guess. And surrealist writings, basically, are, this is also the part of the psychological uh, discoveries. Also, the kind of uh, conditioning they have expressed uh, through their writings. There's, they were al always thought about uh, that how the writing should affect. Why they have th thought about like because they were conscious that the psychology is somewhere you know, creating some uh, kind of patterns 
the writing patterns and i guess uh, they thought in that way that this writing patterns somewhere has been traditionally through this traditions by uh, like these uh, cultural dominant dominating people or cultural dominating class they have created all these writings and that's why they also focused on writings as well and that was happened after that was uh, that was like that was more happened after when uh, in 1916 uh, Ferdinand the Saussure Saussure was a linguistic a linguist and he structuralist as well because he saw writings as not something in relation to the previous century means uh, diachronically that is like relating diachronic means a kind of time so chronic chronology like you can say chronic right so chronology and diachronic means like <clears throat> it has interfaces right so diachronically he uh, he never saw uh, the writing he was the first uh, linguistic who saw writings as synchronic synchronically so writing within within writing he found the uh, the uh, the problems or the matter of discussion the matter of discovery and the materials for himself to he never wrote anything about when when we saw that uh, uh, in 1960 whatever was produced the collections of his uh, uh, writings in other words but that was produced by uh, his uh, students and he was a tutor while he was just teaching to them so uh, right from 1911 to 1916 whatever he taught to them they they have written a notes on that and they have collected the notes and published under the name of so so in 1916 <coughs> sorry in 1916 this uh, tract or uh, this writings basically has affected several other schools schools you know the branches of the other other uh, branches like that we also discussed i guess in the previous semester regarding the schools which schools that were influenced and affected structuralist schools you know any any idea of any structuralist school? The formalist schools uh, was that Russian formalism. So Russian Zits and then American, we have that. Uh, so this formalist, they and their uprisings was all due to this uh, this uh, productions in 1916. Now how other writers like T. S. Eliot, who wrote uh, his famous work in 1922. The Westland. He was, however, not so much mature when you read his uh, the proof rock. So when he pro produced in 1915, when he produced that, he was not so much mature enough. Well, he when he was writing this, and uh, I guess uh, I need to see that it is 1915 or 1911. I'm just confused with that. Just look it into that. So when he produced this, uh, and you, we have that, I guess, in our syllabus this time. If you see, you will see that the uh, even though that when we read, uh, we uh, go through that psychological, neurotic world which is created by an individual. Prufrock is a fellow <coughs> distressed. He is just thinking about what has happened and what is happening with him so again there is a world which is psychologically created there is there but after this when you will find in westland the westland you will find the writings as a focal part of uh, the writer the poet uh, t.s Eliot, because he focused more on writing rather than the something which psychologically or something that he has already given into proof rock so he hasn't made a world which is neurotic or something but he has he has created a, a writing 
even James Joyce is has also focused on writing somewhere. Which work it is, uh, Ulysses or in any other one, in that he focused just on writing, the how the writing, the stream, stream of consciousness is psychological again, but then he focused on writing and something that a kind of experiments on writing that they have done. Ulysses, right? What what is what is that the special aspect? What? No, I'm talking of Ulysses. What's the special aspect that when uh, Ulysses was produced, which kind of special aspect of writing? Can anyone remind me? Ha. Huh. Right, right, right. Okay. I guess this was the one when in interview James Joyce has claimed that out of his Ulysses writing, once if the Dublin is destroyed, maybe through uh, atom bomb, complete divorce, they can again rebuild just through reading the Ulysses, rebuild again as it is. So that is something that's so precise, he has claimed in an interview, that so precise, each and every, uh, like, streets and the, the ways that, through which people can pass by and then they also uh, leave at their houses, their offices, whatever that. So they, that was precisely uh, discussed, precisely shown and expressed in the work. And the writing is somewhere like this. It's not an easy. It was a time when an American writer, Ernest Hemingway, there was also a class of writers that they were influenced by Ernest Hemingway's writings. When the people were writing in such a way that was classy, like T.S. Eliot and other John's Joyce, and these were the elite writers, and their work was elite literature. This was a high modernism. There was a modernism after 1900, but the high modernism era started after 1919, so after First World War, and onwards until 1930. Because after 1930, there was a kind of a reverse flow that has started with the moment poet, the moment poets. And there was a reverse opposite, something like uh, I forgot my writer's name in that the moment poet. Anyone know about this? The moment poets. Do you have this book? Uh, for... In that the moment poet they were also written against the so till 1930. After 1990 till 1930, this is uh, in, uh, the period, the duration in which the writings happened with this high modernism. What I was talking about that in America, there was one writer who wrote something differently because see, every writing, every uh, different continent and all this that encompasses and makes modern age because you cannot consider only T.S. Eliot and he cannot dominate over on modern age. Oscar Wilde was there, but uh, he, he is considered as the uh, decadence and the part of the century of the Victorian era, where it's the, it's the last 10, 10 years in which, but he can be said as the one who influenced. And decadence all can also be considered as modern, uh, uh, the modern writers. Uh, and this is what but the several scholars, they, they, they were modern. And that's why they were called decadence. Why? Because that Victorian era, they considered values, this ethics, morals, all the things 
is more important than any other things but the complete opposite was the modern age and their writing they didn't believe in that something that ethics what is ethics they question on it what is moral they question on it this era is completely questioning on the ideals right right so ideally you should say that modern age has started somewhere in 1819 not 1900 why we are bifurcating yes started diverse right true true similarly the writing by uh, hopkins gm hopkins and uh, his poetry when he while he was writing and uh, while he was writing it was in 1870 1870 and when he died all his poetry according to his wish should be buried with him so in his tomb all these poetries they were buried until in 1913 1913 when robert bridge robert bridge he is a close friend and now poet laureate then poet laureate he wished that his friend used to write fabulously fabulously wonderfully and his poetry uh has a great modernist charm modern era's taste so he wished and according to his wish that um, according to uh, robert bridge it was unearthed and his uh, they rediscovered their and collected recollected uh, his writings that he has already created in nine, before 19, 1870 so after 50 years almost you can say after 40 or 50 years his uh, writing was rediscovered and was published by robert bridge his writing influenced several poets including t s eliot t s eliot uh, uh, praised a lot what uh, g m hopkins has written because that also focused on writing that focus not on the matter matter is not important the way the presentations is very important this era has the another feature this is the characteristics the way is very important the what is not very important but how is important in other words this era has question so this era and another another characteristic you can say is the questionings on ideals questionings on uh, preset norms and questionings on taboos you know breaking taboos so you are you writing this or should i just write some of the characteristics here so first characteristic you can say is questioning on ideal Taboo breaking. discovering
psychological realm. Which other we have discussed? I guess this four. Any other that we have learnt? Yes, I was talking about Ernest Hemingway, an American writer. See, these are the kind of differences you will find here. Uh, there is no uh, one one trend. One trend is going on. There are several trends, and that is also uh, features of. And I will I will talk about these different trends. So there is no one trend. Uh, what we what we call it, plural pluralism in trends, right? Pluralism in trends. So trends in what? In writing and uh, literary production. Yes. Pluralism in trends. Uh, Ernest Hemingway is uh, unlike the others, uh, these writers, and he, he used to write during this period. Uh, any novel, the, uh, novella, especially novella, have you read about? Is it Old Man and the Sea? When you read that, it's kind of a plain writing and very short sentences. It is very true, and then full stop. Something like that. So, uh, short sentences. And uh, Akhil Sarma, there is one diasporic writer who mentioned about in his novel, The Family Life, about Ernest Hemingway. He's written recently in uh, uh, 2014, like just uh, seven years ago, he, he has written one novel on that family life by Akhil Sarma. A very interesting novel. I just read it last year. He talks about Ernest Hemingway, how he was influenced by him, and then in his writing, he has just, and with this footstep of Ernest Hemingway, even after you can say a century after, he is influencing, Ernest Hemingway is influencing the other writers. Completely plain writing. And you can express much more than you can just express the, the way when you follow uh, Ernest Hemingway, you can express much more. But this is uh, completely opposite to what the philosophical writings these days you can find uh, some uh, theoretical writings uh, when when you read any theories like any literary theory any cultural theory any social theories you won't find such writings in that and it is not possible because there are several things which creates a complications the uh, and that's why it requires to encompasses all these things together into that uh, fold and that's why writings become complex and that's why you will see this philosophical, even philosophy as well as the theoretical uh, writings, they, they are complex. And they need to be. They cannot be plain. It cannot be uh, explained, something that you explain uh, and you can narrate and describe something, an event or any incidents that is occurring or happening before you. This is something opposite to that. But writings of the writers like the modernist, high modernist, like T. S. Eliot and others, they have uh, followed the writings which is classical. Somewhere they brought from classical, somewhere they have brought something into this uh, philosophy. They have combined all these writings and all the uh, fields into their writings. They have also taken the Renaissance writing. And this is something that you will find in the pluralism in writings that they have also taken the some excerpt from Indian writings. Sanskrit as well. Santi here, Santi here, something like this is the last line of Westland. Westland. So they have taken the excerpt. Not only this, but the uh, when you uh, read Ezra Pound, Ezra Pound is also, uh, he's, he also talked about uh, haiku, Japanese haiku. And he also taken several uh, excerpts from Chinese writing, in his writing. These writers, they have brought the, their, uh, their matters, their, uh, the way of writing, the structures, the pattern 
from different uh, you know continent and region from different countries and uh, Ferdinand the Sosos I would like to say was the one who roamed across the world so he went to several countries and he uh, read different literatures of uh, different uh, countries including Indian uh, Indian literature in that he found very interesting uh, writing from Panini he is a gra Sanskrit grammarian and in his uh, writing Panini's writing the concept was something which talks about structuralism and from where he brought an idea of structuralism that is a pattern thank you so see you the next time thank you everyone